On behalf of the motion picture industry, welcome to the world of home video entertainment. Literally, for years and years, every time you bought a Code Red DVD release, at the very beginning, when you first popped the disc in, this trailer would autoplay, and it would be burp, 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 family honor, family honor. And you you would you would listen to this trailer play and you would hear Fortunato! They mind your father! They mind your father! Where is this sister? It makes no difference when they disrespect the family honor. You, you know how many people you know you know, you know how many people kill your father? Two hundred, maybe three hundred people. They call it an organization. Oh my god, family honor. Finally, the 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 the, 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 the not, not the DVD, but the Blu-ray is out. This we this is now predated technologies. This is the, this this trailer was on so many releases, and now the Family Honor Blu-ray is out from Code Red. Finally, a dirty, gritty-looking mob revenge thriller from the '70s, New York City. The film begins with a gangland murder of a policeman. Uh, and then we see the the, grease, the, the policeman's uh, grieving widow and the son of the policeman, uh, this guy, Joey Fortunato, who is kind of a, a guy of between two worlds. He's a policeman, but he's also kind of a street guy. He's hanging out on the streets. You know, he looks like kind of a hip guy. And, uh, and, and uh, this, this, this guy, Fortunato, is having such pressure put upon him by his mother. You gotta revenge your father! You gotta... And it's just like the trailer. The, the beginning of the movie is just, the trailer tells you exactly what you're in for with yelling and screaming. You gotta kill your father. You gotta kill your father. And from the very beginning, we're not really sure what's going on. Um, because, and, and it, I thought that was very interesting because it's very, this film, it's a very gritty realistic film and it's very much about you know how you know there's no you know on the streets the right the right and the wrong kind of the morality of the situation just kind of mixed gets mixed in you know and you're not really sure who's the good guy and who's the bad guy and the policemen maybe are the bad guys and the street guys maybe the good guy and uh it, it, again, it, it, this is a 1972 film, so it's, it really kind of predates Martin Scorsese or kind of just goes right along with it. It feels like a little touch of Mean Streets and Serpico and, and, uh, uh, and uh, William Friedkin's, uh, you know, the, the French Connection and all those kind of gritty, gritty 70s uh, crime mob films. This film, you know, it goes right along with it. So this guy, Joey Fortunato, he has, he feels all this pressure from his family, both his mother and his uncle, who's, uh, the, his uncle, whose uh, son is like a cop, and perhaps not a very straight and narrow cop. And, uh, and, and uh, he starts, uh, you know, hassling this mobster that his family thinks murdered his father. And uh, the and the, the mobster, these he, the mobster's henchmen are <laughs> Leslie West of Mountain and Leslie West Drummer of Mountain, and it's like it's incredible. This, this Leslie West, who is like very recognizable, and why the hell is Leslie West in this movie? You know, what is he? He, he he's he, Leslie West is running, and you know Leslie West. If you know Mountain, he got a bullfrog voice. You know what's the great thing about this boat? It don't belong to you. And he's like, <laughs> and basically, Leslie West is like the worst henchman in the world because he just he just go he gets beaten up. He just every at every turn, Leslie West is is getting beaten up. And uh, it's a it's a great I mean, uh, it's a great film. It's, uh, there's a couple of twists and turns in the film, which uh, you know really kind of knocked me back. And again, like. It, 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 the twists and the turns, again, are all about playing out this kind of ambiguity of the streets of, you know, who's right and who's wrong. And sometimes you just get like this this guy, Joey Fortunato, just gets kind of pushed into this situation, you know, uh, that, that he, he really has no control over. And he's like, what is this, Sicily? You're going to start a blood vendetta. But it's it's a it's a good 
it's such a, a good movie. It's like, really, why is this so obscure? Why is this so difficult to find? Why, for years and years and years, it was not available on home video? I don't think it was even available as a bootleg. It was available the last few years in that the director, I think, had a copy of the Code Red transfer and they put it up on YouTube. So for a few years, it was available on, on YouTube, but the copy was really, I mean, they had um, enabled on YouTube, and it may still be on YouTube. It was in multiple parts as well. And they enabled the, um, the, uh, the image stabilization on YouTube, which is the worst thing to manually, it, the image stabilization is great, but it, it would, they, it, it, it warps and distorts. It, it looks just, everything just looks like something out of a horror film, like a funhouse mirror or horror movie. And uh, that's the way the movie looked for years. But now the Blu-ray is out. The Blu-ray, I, I think, is, um, it, it's from apparently 16 millimeter elements. And it looks like what it is, is it's a 16 millimeter reduction of the 35 millimeter uh, 35 millimeter original. And, it, and I don't know enough about the, the whole lab process in the seventies and how they would do the, the 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter, uh, reduction. I guess it's the reverse of a 16 to 35 blow up, but the 35 to 16 millimeter reduction, it seems what they've done is because you go throughout the movie, there, there's some web, there's some websites and and reviews of this Blu-ray uh, that say that it looks uh, that they've done an open matte, and it's not open matte. It doesn't. I mean, you look at the headroom. If you ever looked at it really a, tr a semi, tr you know, open matte or whatever transfer, uh, you you notice there's a lot of headroom, and, and it doesn't look right. Uh, the family honor this this Blu-ray. There's no headroom. It's like, in fact, some heads are cut off, and the sides are cut off a little bit. What it feels like they did is they took like the 185, um, the 185 35 millimeter, uh, you know, uh, uh, image area, and then transferred that to 16, which is of course more more four by three. It's basically a square. And then at times you see in the films they they pan scan the thing. You see them going this this way or that way, in in a crude optical pan and scanning, and with no headroom. And uh, there's uh, you see him panning and scanning, uh, particularly in that scene where where Fortunato hands in his badge. And uh, I guess I'm, I hope I'm not giving away too much, but I mean, you know, every cop in every cop movie, the guy who hands in his badge, you know, whatever. Uh, but you see him pan and scan a little bit in that, and um, and. And, and I guess they were doing the 16 millimeter print because in the 70s, 16 millimeter was like, it was like home video. You would have a 35 millimeter release, and then you'd have 16 millimeters, which were shown in places where movies need to be shown, in uh, prisons, in hospitals, in uh, military installations, and in colleges, and schools, and universities. That was a big market. That was a big market in the set. Everybody had a six. Every uh, uh, you know, even semi, uh, not even semi, any college, university, high school had a 16 millimeter setup, if not a full blown projection room. When I was going to, to college, uh, in, in, in 1997, I, I, I took a film class and we saw a lot of 16 millimeter films, 16 millimeter silent films at that point, because even in the late, late nineties, that was ending. But that was a big market, and I'm assuming, I guess, that was how the reason why this 16 millimeter print of of the film was made. Uh, so it it what that does is I think it's a it, it feels cropped and it feels tense, and 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 it makes a tense movie even more tense. You know, there, there's something there's something about a pan and scanned version of a movie that it's not the the it's not the full image area. It's not the intentions of the film, but there is something about pan and scan that can somehow you're you're looking into, and especially also the pan and scan, especially in the '80s, where there were these muddy video transfers, these muddy pan and scan video transfers, where it can make a scene 
or or a set of scenes or even a whole movie more tense because you're just it's so zoomed in focused in like zombie the first time i saw uh lucio fulci's zombie was um on wizard video vhs and uh there's that scene where, where the woman gets the spike through her through her uh through eyeball and it's such a tense scene, pan and scan, because you only see like the crevices of light just coming in, and the uh, the, the the sounds of tenseness, and, and you just hear it, you know. Come, whereas in the full, you know, scope pan and scan, you you get a lot more of like what's really going on. So there's so it does produce this fact that this there is this is this kind of a compromised version of family honor. The, the also the grittiness. I mean, I'm sure the lab processes in the, uh, the the 70s for going from 35 to 16. I'm sure if you saw a, I'm sure if you saw a a transfer of family honor from the original negative, I'm sure it would look like it was shot yesterday. I mean, I, I mean, I, I have no doubt. It just it probably looked like a really beautiful film. It still looks like a beautiful film. I mean, they have gotten some film elements here, and they look good, but it's more the grindhouse uh, look. It's more the grindhouse, the gritty look. And in, it does suit this film, honestly, the, the grindhouse, gritty, zoomed-in film, because this is a film of close-ups, of tense close-ups of everything, of an eight ball uh, uh, moving across a pool table as a tense phone call is made, little snatches, shots of a, uh, of a gun barrel going off, and, and it's, it's, this, and it's, it's very, there's not too many wide shots. You're always tense. You're always in. You're always in the in the mix, and uh, I, I think it produces a very interesting effect. Performances are, are are across the board incredible. You know, New York New York actors. You know, some of the best actors, the best actors of the seventies. You know, everybody was coming out there. I mean, it was like you know, and even in this movie, I mean, you had Tony Page. Tony Page, who is the the lead actor who plays the, our, our our lead character, this kind of conflicted character, kind of partly in the streets with the kind of the Serpico beat cop, who's again has this family obligation, the family honor, and, and so he's being pulled in, in multiple directions. This guy, uh, Tony Page, didn't do a lot of movies. Didn't do a lot of movies. Uh, was in Prince of the City. And then died in like 1984 of cirrhosis of the liver. But I think he was in, in the theater scene. He was a friends with this guy from Michael Gazzo, uh, a, you know, a real heavy theater actor, a real well respected actor who was who was in uh, you know, the Godfather too. And I think from that that friendship uh, and, and 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 that kind of working relationship, there was some he was able to get movies. Uh, but I mean, he he really is an incredible actor. But like you know, one of those guys, one of those guys who came out of the '70s who just like didn't live very long, you know, just had, uh, you know, got into um, the alcohol and it really cut him down, you know. And a lot, a lot of those guys, you know, it's think of a lot of those '70s actors that really barely made it out of the '70s, you know, um, or people like John Cazale who did some incredible films, and of course he had a. He had an illness that didn't he didn't uh, you know die of drug or alcoholism, but it's just so many. He's he's like one of those actors where there were many of there were probably dozens and dozens of these actors that they you you look at their filmography and you're like man that guy's such a good actor he's such a great actor, and then you, and then you see it stop and then you see you know died in 1983 1984 he's one of those guys, the mob guys very very realistic very. Yeah, you, know, you you know, there's a lot of these little, a lot of actresses and actors in this film. You see in their filmography later on, The Sopranos and other, and, the, and there's a lot of actors from The Soprano in this movie. Um, the lead bad guy, um, the the main mobster who um, Carlo, you didn't see him. He's not in a lot of movies. He, he this is I think as far as his only credit. The film does remind me of uh, of uh, Masker Mafia style in that. Uh, you know, uh, it, it is kind of like Massacre Mafia style, and that it was kind of like a even the font of the uh, the poster kind of resembles the Massacre Mafia style font. It's the Haunted Mansion font. <laughs> it's a Ravenscroft, and uh, and uh, but yeah, much 
Yeah, I mean, the, the message of, of Massacre Mafia style is much like family honor in that crime doesn't pay and that, you know, uh, this, this, this blood vendetta, you know, it, it never stops. It, it eventually just goes to, you know, father against son. It's just, and it's kind of like, it's almost a very negative view of the mob lifestyle. It, it is. It, it, there, there is an element of the, the action film and celebratory, but I mean, it's always like a traditional, you know, crime and punishment. That crime doesn't pay. If you gotta, you know, if you, you do the crime, you gotta do the time. And, uh, and um, the very ending of this film, in the, in the, the, beginnings in the, the beginning scenes in the cemetery and the ending of the cemetery, where uh, Joey Fortunato's um, uncle uh, says something, and it's, and and I think it just sends Joey Fortunato on like, you know, what, where am I in? What were, what world am I, have I gotten into? It's uh, it's an interesting ending, and uh, it does remind me of Masker Mafia Styles ending as well, in a way. Uh, so I mean, if you're a fan of Masker Mafia Style, and that was always the the allure. If this, you know, we had Masker Mafia Style, and that came out, but this movie, Family Honor, like didn't it was like you know where who who was involved in making this movie? Why did why was it so suppressed for many years? I mean, it was released theatrically in the '70s, but uh, it just seemed to kind of disappear. You know where to go? You know uh, what? You know what happened to it? But uh, it's a. I, I'm just glad it's been able to somehow become resurfaced because you know if you love those Scorsese films, if you love like the Seven Ups, it does remind me a lot of the seven, the kind of the gritty, the grittiness of of the Seven Ups, uh, and um, it's not it's not Masker Mafia style. In that Masker Mafia style, it was a little more West Coast, and this is very East Coast, very. You know the William Friedkin, French Connection. You know, you know, and a little bit of Panic and Needle Park too. There's a needle scene that's like, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, oof. You know, it's very funny. You could see a a scene of like ten billion people being their heads being chopped off, but a one one scene of some some needle going to somebody's arm. You go, you know, it's it's just such, ooh, uh, it's ooky. But uh, that you know, that looked that looked a little too real. There's a lot of things in this film that looks really real. You know, I I mean I think that was one of the thing about the the crime films of the 70s. This is the city had a certain look, people had a certain look, and even though every once in a while there's some things that look a little bit off. There's a little you know a little powdered uh, hair to make somebody look a little bit old, or somebody's doing you know there is this overwhelming ring of authenticity to the surroundings of what's going on in this film that washes out any kind of technical deficiency. It's just so good. And the story and the characters, especially with this one where it's not really a straight ahead plot where there's all these kind of twists and turns and you're not really sure what's going on. And there's little scenes, there's little character scenes where it might necessarily not move around uh, along the plot, especially with this main mobster, Carlo. There's the his life, his uh, his relationship with his daughter, who was later to, to play a part in The Sopranos, and uh, his, you know, and then the, his, marrying off his other daughter, and these all of these kind of little character things, and the relationship that Tony has with this woman, and, which allow you to bring out the plot in, an, in a rather organic fashion, whereas in a regular movie, it would, it would be more kind of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, da, da, da. You start this film not really knowing, you know, who, why, who, why, who's killed who, and everything. and then throughout the film, it, it, it slowly, the, the plot slowly elucidates itself, and everything becomes clear, and it it becomes something I think very special. I mean, would I like to see a nice, fully remastered version of the film? Yes. Does this uh, current kind of muddy 16 millimeter kind of gritty version also suit the film as well? That too, absolutely. Uh, a great mob film and something if you love mob movies, hopefully this will get out a little bit further into the world, into the streaming world, and uh, will be become wi more widely available because it definitely deserves so. And, and the, the work of Tony Page is in the lead actor. 
I mean, his his performance, uh, his lead performance uh, deserves to be seen.